you know, when he began, um, sort of gave us a very good backdrop of uh, what defines labor law in the subcontinent. I spent a couple of hours sort of breaking my head over that this morning, and I'm relieved I don't have to do that. And I'm being quite honest, Karama, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I. Uh, I think it's important to flag, and we did that, 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 that anybody who wants to sort of trace what happened to labor law in the subcontinent needs to uh, look at the Trade Unions Act 1926 and the Trade Youth Disputes Act 1929 to sort of see how, 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 you know, what the original framework was, and of course how it's, um, you know, uh, rather strangely, one would say of what was a colonial law, how it's come to be emasculated over the years in various parts of the subcontinent, in all countries of the subcontinent. Uh, I would, however, draw uh, attention to the fact that, you know, labor law is actually also protected uh, by every constitution uh, within, the, within the subcontinent, uh, from, especially from very clear, uh, sorry, three very clear uh, 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 perspectives. Uh, one is the right to freedom of association, which is which is which is fundamental and elemental at this point. Uh, the second is the right to 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 to, to assembly, uh, which is the right to protest, uh, which uh, and the third is uh, equality uh, before law. And I think the point about equality before law, uh, when we're talking about uh, employment law, but about employer-employee relations, is it's not equality before law amongst equals. It's actually what law has come to understand, and something we also uh, 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 inherited from from rulings of the Privy Council uh, was that in employer-employee relationships, it's not the law of contract uh, between equals, but the law of a powerful employer versus versus a not so powerful employee. Uh, which is something that's been been understood as part of uh, part of equality of uh, law. I'm also sort of hoping uh, someone else I've learned a great deal from, in fact, learned to interpret labor law, uh, is 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 in this audience. That's uh, and I dare say I learned to interpret labor law from him, not as someone who teaches labor law, but somebody who, uh, when I began my time in the trade union, was also a member of the trade union, so to speak. Uh, um, so, so uh, anyway, uh, let me sort of begin by, you know, sort of just, just, just endorsing what, what Karamat said, that yes, there is, there is a problem of the formal and the informal, which is extremely accentuated in the subcontinent. But if you think about what's happening to employment relations, the problem between the formal and the fo informal is rapidly ceasing to be. Uh, it's the it's the it's the place of employment that may be formal or informal, but increasingly, rather like in the in the, in the garment factory that he talked about, only a very small minority of workers actually employ formal working conditions, and even those increasingly. Uh, 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 really only on paper enjoy formal conditions. So I am in fact more inclined to move to a definition of those who work in conditions of informality. And uh, they constitute the vast majority of even those who work in the so-called formal sector, which includes the Jawaharlal Nehru University, for, you, for, for instance. Uh, the chap guarding this building is from an outsourced agency uh, and he, in my understanding, works in conditions <coughs> of informality, even though he actually is a security guard at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, which is a university created and protected by national statute in this country. And that's just one example. But, but if, you, if you go to a luxury hotel, uh, you will find that there are people who are, who are, who are actually you know, sweeping, sweeping the uh, driveway uh, they are not employees of that hotel company. That hotel company may be owned by the Tatars or some other very large corporate. So these are all workers who are actually in conditions of informality. And this is not a problem that's particularly Indian or a problem that's uh, peculiarly South Asian. This is really this is actually what defines uh, what is the nature of neoliberal capital. And uh, if. Just for the sake of it, if I were to take issue with Karamat, you don't need, and I think, I mean, you know, there's no disagreement really over here, you don't need a military regime to, 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 to oppress workers. It's the nature of capital that oppresses workers. And I do want to flag or note today, I don't know how many have heard, have, 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 have heard of Marikana. Has anybody over here heard about the shooting at Marikana? 
Uh, this is the shooting by the South African police of 34 mine workers exactly a year today. Uh, uh, and I think this is the, the world of work, really. Um, I read in one of the newspapers that nobody has been brought to justice and nothing has happened in the Manik Marikana coal, co uh, coal mines other than, of course, the fact that now there is no union over there. The difference in the one year is there was a union one year ago, today there is no union. So what that outburst succeeded in was actually busting the union. And before I get into, sort of get into specifics, uh, since we live in one of the most, this subcontinent is indeed, I heard a voice from Afghanistan, but, but you know, Afghanistan is really no exception. Uh, we live in really the most significant war zone in, in the, on, this, on, this, on this planet, uh, which, is, which is defined by, by what's come to be called terror. I'm just going to sort of flag with you two, two things that are part of the world of work which we derive from the so-called work of terror. And those who fight terror need to actually take a very hard look at uh, the fight against their fight against terror that can only be fought if they fight irregular work or conditions of informality. Uh, you must have all, you may not have heard of Marikana, but I don't think it's easy in the subcontinent to get away from the events of what are called 2611, which is the events of 26 November 2008 in Mumbai City when the Taj Hotel and uh, a bunch of other sort of properties were attacked by, by, by uh, some gun wielding young men. Uh, one part of the police investigation, nobody's really dwelt very hard on it. I mean, you know, it's all about whether Kassab should be hung or not hung, uh, apart from the fact that, that I think most of us would agree that nobody should be hung. One part of the police record that, 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 that actually uh, nobody has spent much time thinking about is that these young gunmen mapped both the two luxury hotels weeks in advance and they spent several days inside those hotels as contract employees. Uh, and this is the nature of irregular employment, the nature of the non-111 that Karamat was talking about. I am a contract employee at the Taj Mahal Hotel in Bombay. I'm going to be absent today. I give that card to you. And although my photograph might even be on it, the fact is the nature of irregular employment is that nobody is actually checking whether it's me or it's you. And so these chaps actually spent days inside the Taj Hotel cleaning people's rooms, walking through the corridors, working out where the back elevators were. They physically mapped the hotel before they got in there to kill. And they could only get in there because the Taj Hotel employs four out of five of its employees are in regular work. So this is, this is you know, something which those who fight the war on terror need to think about. Anybody can get inside anywhere because the urge for profits is such that uh, they will let anybody in. You can have fingerprinting, you can have biometric entry, you can have all that, but, but that, all of that sort of mitigates against the urge of profit. And I think the second thing that comes, and I think that's very fundamental today, at least in industrial India, uh, in, in, in defending democratic rights, is what came in terms of legislation post to, uh, 2611 is the legalization of the use of the CCTV in private spaces. Uh, 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 so, 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 so the, un, the, the, the prevention of un, un, uh, unlawful activities, uh, the uh, prevention of unlawful activities act, and the information technology act are used by employers to on shop floors, which are not public places because only a fixed number of employees enter there. It's not the Taj Hotel. It's not a railway station. But employers use CCTVs in factories to actually watch what workers are doing. And what they are watching most of all is not whether workers are working hard or not working hard. They are actually watching whether one worker is talking to another worker and then they are building records of how much time workers. I mean, for instance, in Maruti Suzuki, which, I will, which I'm going to talk about, there is a camera outside the toilet which snaps you with the time when you go in and when you come out. So there's proof how much time you spent in the toilet so you can be charge sheeted for, 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 how, for, for spending too much time in the toilet. I mean, one of the many stories that came out of Maruti Suzuki, for instance, is, and I don't know how many of you know, that an auto plant, a uh, world scale auto plant, which is what the Maruti Suzuki plants are in India, is something like between one and a half and two kilometers long. And at Maruti Suzuki, the toilets were all stacked at the two ends 
There was a seven minute tea and toilet break. There is no way you can walk a kilometer humanly when you're actually engaged in manual work. So this is also your rest break. You have two seven minute breaks in, in eight hours. There's no way humanly you can actually walk to a toilet, even if you were only halfway up the shop floor, and actually pee and have a cup of tea. Yeah? So this is, and all of this is being regulated and watched. I mean, you know, Suzuki themselves reported that they had 1,100 cameras operating on their, on their, on their, on their, on their shop floor. Well, Karamat, I'm going to let that pass. There are many over here, you know, then we would have to get into the history of India of the 1970s and personal history. So I'm going to leave that. That's for another generation and for another moment. But I, I, I rather like that. Uh, I'm first going to talk about Maruti Suzuki, but if I, I do want to say Maruti Suzuki is perhaps the most visible case, but it's not an exception. And in the documents that, you've been, that have been circulated, there's a report uh, of the, uh, the fact-finding report of the International Commission for Labor Rights that we were a part of to look at the abuse of labor rights at Maruti Suzuki. There's also a more detailed report uh, uh, on that case by the People's Union of Democratic Rights. Uh, some of you may know that that's a progressive democratic rights uh, organization um, uh, in India. Uh, third, there's a, f a fact finding by the Trade Union Solidarity Committee on a similar instance of an Indian company called Regency Ceramics um, in, um, in the state of Andhra Pradesh or the Union and Territory of Pondicherry. Uh, and finally, there's a sheaf of papers which has a statement, a set of statements of the New Trade Union Initiative, and that will tell you. And I mean, you know, this is just a sample of our statements on the violation of right to freedom of association. And what those sheaf of statements, among other things, will tell you is that you may be an airline pilot earning three lakhs of rupees a month in a private company, or you might be on a tea garden in Assam earning three thousand rupees a month. But the fact is your employment rights are almost equally under attack today uh, in every sense of the term. And just to sort of pick up from really where Karamat left off, it's interesting that the British brought in the Essential Services Maintenance Act for WASH. Essential Services Maintenance Act came to be something that was used in public transport even in peacetime. And now, government is saying, why not use the Essential Services Maintenance Act when there's private variation or private transport, use that for the private sector as well. So is a private sector company when you, you know, globalization is all about competition. We have half a dozen airline companies. So what if one of them is on strike? How does that affect me or you or the average person? It's not an essential service. If you actually need to fly, you can fly by another airline. How does one, a strike in one airline make it an essential service? Uh, so, so, so this is, I think, this throws up interesting questions of how the right to freedom of association is actually um, sort of, sort of, sort of buried, buried in. I mean, very, very briefly to sort of go over the case of Maruti, and I'll, I'll sort of present the story briefly, and then look at some of the issues that 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 that, that, that emerge from there. Um, and I would.